Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, chapter 49. That may sound like an odd place uh, to be preaching out of with the season that we're in, but I think you'll see what we're going to look at very shortly. In Genesis chapter 49, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 8 through 10 this morning. Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 10. I entitled the message this morning, The King is Coming. Y'all know that old song, The King is Coming? Oh, what a wonderful song it is because it speaks of a truth. That the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has already come, he came the first time as a servant who gave his life on the cross of Calvary for each of us for our salvation if we simply put our faith in him. He is coming again and he's not coming as a humble servant this time. He's coming as the conquering king, the Messiah. Uh, there's two words that are used for Jesus as king, the word Messiah and the word Christ. I'm sure all of you have heard both of these words. The word Messiah is a Hebrew word that means the anointed one. Either king or a priest were anointed and were called a Messiah. But the Messiah was the chosen anointed one that the Jews knew was coming, the promised one of all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 13. The Christ, the word Christ, is the Greek word, uh, the same, almost the same word. It means an anointed one. And it was for the king or the high priest only. And of course, the Christ was the chosen one of God, again, that was going to come and give his life as a ransom for many. But Jesus' life did not end on the cross of Calvary. Y'all say amen. amen. We know that he rose again. He is at the right hand of Father now. But he is coming again. He is coming again to set up rule right here on this earth very soon as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know, sometimes when uh, we get to this season, we, we see a lot of people talking about Jesus, at least a little bit, being around the Christmas season. But many of those people, that some of them that even have a manger scene in their front yard, really don't know the importance of why Jesus came, the importance of who Jesus is. Uh, I want to tell you this. Jesus coming as King, Messiah, and Savior it was not an afterthought. In other words, it was not something God had to think up real quick after sin happened. It was always God's plan. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus not only always has existed because he is God, but he has always been the king and the Messiah. Listen to a few of these verses. The Bible says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. He is the lamb that is slain from the foundation of the world. Another verse in the Bible says, Christ, the Lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the world for the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And finally, this, this verse, y'all listen closely to this one. Eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. I want you all to think about that. The message of salvation. God made the choice of the method of salvation before anyone was ever created. Amen? Jesus was already in place. And Jesus knew, God knew, this kind of uh, is exciting when I think about it. God knew even before he created anything that we would be here on this day preaching the gospel. Isn't that neat to think Amen. about? Nothing sneaks up on God. God's plan to be the king over his people has always been. In fact, did you know that this is what got Satan in trouble? Satan didn't want to be higher than God. He wanted to be the king. Did you all know that? I want us to read our text, and then we're going to go look a little bit at that, and I think you'll find it interesting. But look here at our text first. Genesis chapter 49 and verse 8. These are the blessings of Jacob unto his children. And he comes to the child Judah. And, and remember that Jacob had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. So these blessings were not only on these individual sons. They also went to the tribe as well. And now comes the blessing to Judah. 
Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he crouches as a lion, as an old lion who shall rouse him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The Bible says right here that the scepter, the king's scepter, would not leave the tribe of Judah until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is another name for the Messiah, and we're going to see that in just a moment. But God's promise here to Judah was that the king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, would come through Judah, through this tribe. And of course, we know that Jesus came as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? But now I want us to go back into history past. Now, I made a comment just a minute ago that Satan got in trouble because he wanted to be king. I want you all to turn your Bibles very quickly to the book of Isaiah. We've got a lot to cover is why I say turn quickly. If we get out late, it's y'all's fault. Y'all didn't turn quick enough. Amen. Everybody blame Barbara. It's her fault. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And look down to verse 12. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. Now I want you to think about it again before we read these verses. God's plan before the world began, as we read the verses, was for Jesus to come, for Jesus to die in our place, and for Jesus to be set up as the king over all of us. But look what Lucifer does. Look at verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? The word for means because. This is the reason that he fell. Because thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. The word throne simply means authority. I will exalt my authority above the stars of God. The word stars there is referencing the other angels. In other words, I'm going to be the top angel. I'm going to, my authority is going to be greater than any other angel. And notice what he says here. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Well, what is on the holy mountain of God? He's speaking of the tabernacle, the temple that is sitting in place there. So not only did he want to be king, he also wanted to be the high priest. Look at verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. But the Bible says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. You see here, he didn't want to be greater than God. He wanted to be like God because it is God's place to be the king. Amen? But Satan wanted that position. Satan wanted the position that Jesus held. He wanted to be the king of this earth. Uh, do y'all want me to give you something for free? Did you know that uh, you keep pestering God, God will give you what you want, even if it's not what you need? Do you know that? The Bible says that Satan is now the king of this earth as it is a sinful earth. It has been given over to him because we gave ownership over when we followed him. So he is the king of this earth, but he's going to be overthrown by the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? amen. Y'all say amen. Go back to our text now. Let us look at the king, the Messiah, that has always been promised. He was the one that came in Bethlehem, born as a baby. That is the reason the shepherds came, the wise men came. All these came to worship and adore him because they knew that he was the king. Right here in verse 8, he begins talking to this son Judah. The word Judah means praised, which is kind of interesting in light of this verse, because it goes on to say, Thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. And again, remember when we're looking at this, uh, Judah is just one of the twelve sons of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and his twelve sons were the twelve tribes of Israel. So Judah is just one, but right here it says, your brethren, your brothers will praise you. Uh, the word praise here literally means to celebrate uh, with great honor or respect. In other words, God is telling Judah here 
that your brothers are going to be celebrating or honoring you as greater than them. You know, there is none other that we should worship than God himself. Amen? So when he says your brethren are going to worship you, was he talking to Judah or some seed of Judah? Of course, it would be Jesus who would come through Judah. But he says you're going to have a great honor, even greater than all the other tribes. Uh, what do we call, and I'm going to give the answer as I ask the question, what do we call the Jews today? We call them Jews. Y'all know why we call them Jews? It's the shortened form of the word Judah. We actually call all of the nation of Israel, all of the Hebrews, we actually call them Jews. It goes down to one tribe. So God's promise of Judah receiving a higher honor of course, is fulfilled in that, but it's also fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at this, we understand also that the kings before Jesus would come through the line of Judah. David would come through this same line. Look at the rest of verse 8. It says, or the last part of verse 8, Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. The word bow down literally means to worship. I find it interesting in, in the Psalms that David, as he wrote the Psalms, David said of his own son or his own descendant that he was going to worship him. He named his own descendant as his Lord. David knew that through his line, that who, through his seed, the Messiah or the Christ would come. David knew that. This prophecy right here is about 650 years before the time of David. Let me give you some of the words of David. In fact, this is David's last psalm, speaking of the Messiah. He will rule from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. All the kings will bow down to him and all the nations will serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence. For precious is their blood in his sight. His name will endure forever. His name will continue as long as the sun. All nations will be blessed through him. And they will call him blessed. That is the very last psalm that David wrote. Speaking about Jesus, the Messiah, who was to come. What a wonderful, wonderful promise. But I want you to look here at the last part of verse 8 again. It says, Thy father's children shall bow down. Now, we understand kneeling before a king, but this word bow down here literally means to worship. Well, the Bible is plain. There is no person that we are to worship, even if they are king. But Jesus is no mere person. Amen? Amen. He is God. God is the only one that is worthy of our worship. David knew. It, you know, it's, it's interesting to see what these people in the Old Testament knew. David knew that one of his descendants would actually be God in the flesh. Isn't that something? Because he said, I'm going to worship. That is going to be my Lord. He even had that on his mind, the very last song. I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Micah. That's one of them little, little books. The book of Micah in the Old Testament. Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5, and we'll look at verse 2. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. <clears throat> Catch up if you're not there yet. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, and then it gives another name. That's another name for Bethlehem. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah... Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler. The word ruler there means king in Israel. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now please slow down and look at this verse with me and think about this. Here we have a prophet in the Old Testament saying that through Bethlehem, through the tribe of Judah, that this one is going to come. The Messiah, the ruler of the king is going to come. And here Micah says, 
who's going forth. The words going forth in the Hebrew literally mean his family descent. Or in other words, where he comes from. Well, where does he come from? What does that verse say? Have been from old, from where? From everlasting. In other words, Jesus did not come into being in Bethlehem. Amen? He did not start to exist there in Bethlehem when he was a baby. He has always been. He is from everlasting. He is from eternity past because he is God. You know, isn't it wonderful to see that all of these Old Testament uh, prophets and kings, these people, they, they understood Jesus. They understood the Messiah. They understood that he would be God. Uh, I said before that not all the people that celebrate Christmas, not even all that have a manger scene out in their front yard, understand the uh, magnitude of that little baby, what that little baby is. I love that song, Mary, Did You Know? Y'all like that song? Mary, did you know that you're baby boy? And he goes through all these things. Uh, a few of them always make chills go down my back. He said, did you know when you kiss your little baby, you've kissed the face of God? That's one that just, whew. Uh, did you know that this child that you delivered will soon deliver you? Uh, but probably how it ends is the, the greatest, and it always chokes me up. This sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. Uh, those of us who are studying on Wednesday night the book of John know full well what I am is. These are the words that were spoken by God from the burning bush when Moses said, what is your name? And the burning bush replied, I am that I am. Tell them I am has sent thee unto you. Jesus is the great I am. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Micah knew this. David knew this. Even Job, the oldest book of the Bible, knew it. Y'all remember what Job said? I know that my Redeemer liveth, and upon this earth he will stand. Uh, Y'all turn your Bibles now to Isaiah. We'll quit turning, I'm, I promise, after this. But turn to Isaiah. I know you'll know these verses. Isaiah chapter 9. Look at chapter 9 in Isaiah. Folks, there's no way, if you just study the Bible, that you can deny who Jesus is, both Old Testament, Old Testament and New Testament. There are those today that still reject him, but they are not being honest with the word of God. <clears throat> look at chapter 9 in Isaiah and look at verse 6. You'll recognize these verses. They're always read around Christmas time. In verse 6 in chapter 9, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. In other words, he's going to carry the government. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor. Please look and listen. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Who was the little baby born in Bethlehem? He is the Almighty God. He's the Eternal Father. He is God with us. Notice verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now I want you to look at verse 7. I want you to think about it. And this is the reason why Jesus is still rejected by the Jews today. The Jews wanted a king. They wanted him to come and take them out from under Roman oppression and be this conquering king. But Jesus came not upon the horse. He came sitting upon the donkey. Y'all remember what that is a sign of? If the king comes in town sitting upon a donkey, he comes in time of peace. If he comes on a horse, it's time of war. But the first time Jesus came, he came sitting upon the donkey because he came to give his life. He came and he, he told the Jews this. That you need a savior. If you don't believe in me, you're going to die in your sins. They didn't want to hear that. What they wanted to say is, I'm of the seed of Abraham, I'm fine. We want the king. Did you know the Jews today are still looking for their king to come? The sad part is, is he's coming again. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 19, when heaven is open, he's going to be seated upon the horse next time. He's coming as the conquering king. He's coming back as that conquering king. How many have rejected that fact? The little baby, the man who gave his life on the cross of Calvary. Look at that verse 6 in Isaiah again. 
He is the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. God himself gave his life for you and me. The King of Kings is God himself. Look back at our text in Genesis. Think about it too. We're in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. Moses writing this. Moses understood that Jesus would come to the tribe of Judah and understood that he would be God himself. Because right here in, in verse 8, here, here coming from God, it says, Thy father's children shall worship thee. There is no man to ever be worshipped. In fact, there is no angel to be worshipped. Y'all remember when John knelt down to the angel? What did the angel say? Don't do it. I'm your fellow servant. It is only God who we bow down to. And right here, he knew that through Judah would come the one that we would all bow down to. Right here in verse 8, it also says, Thy hand shall be upon the neck of thine enemies. This shows Christ's victory over all. The book of Psalms says this, Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For time's sake, let me read these out of the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, the Bible says, The kingdoms of the earth shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. The Bible says in the end, all the nations of the world will come against him. Folks, we're sitting in that time. If you can't see an attack on Christianity already happening today, it's happening. And I'm telling you, even amongst religious people, an attack on true Christianity, true Bible teaching Christianity, has already happened. The Bible says literally, though, when he comes back, they're going to try to wage war against him. How silly. <laughs> How silly. The Bible says there in Revelations, he will overcome. Why? He is the king of kings. Revelation goes on to say this, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You know, there are people today that scoff, that mock at people that believe that Jesus is coming to be king of this earth. But the Bible says they too will bow. Their knees will bow. Their tongue will confess. But the sad part is it will be too late for them. Because the Bible promises all those that fail to put their faith and trust in him in this life, they will be separated from him in the lake of fire for eternity. Would y'all turn one more place? I, this is my favorite, and I want y'all to see this. Turn to the book of Psalms. Psalm number 2. Psalm number 2. At least y'all are getting a workout by turning a lot of places today. Psalm number 2. We're going to see this in just a minute, but I want to give you a glimpse beforehand. You know, everybody in our world wants peace. You hear it on TV all the time. Especially over there in the Middle East. Why can, not, why can we not have peace? You know, there's going to be one coming that promises peace. That's the Antichrist. He won't deliver it. True peace will not come to this earth until Jesus is reigning. But I want you to think, why? How is he going to usher in true peace? What prevents us from having peace today? Well, sin prevents that. We prevent that. The reason that he is going to have total peace, the Bible says he's going to rule with a rod of iron. And then at the end of that first thousand years, he's going to do away with all sin and all those that hold to their sin instead of those that trust in him. So how is he going to have peace? How are we going to enter a place where there's going to be no tears, where there's going to be no tragedy, where it's going to be absolute tranquility because all sin is going to be taken away and separated? What a wonderful time. Y'all look at this. I love these verses. Psalm 2, look down to verse... Oh, let's see. Verse 10. Psalm 2 and verse 10. Now this is speaking to the kings of the earth. Listen. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Please go back to verse 2 to pick up why God is saying this. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Remember the word Messiah, the word Christ means the anointed one. So what are the kings of the earth doing? They're trying to overthrow Jesus the king. Now look at this, I love this. He's now saying in verse 10, be wise. 
Please look at verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Verse 12, kiss the sun. <laughs> that is a reference to bowing before, kissing the ring. Have you all ever seen that? Giving homage to the king. He says, kiss the sun. I don't know how people can't see Jesus here. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, or are taken out of the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that do what? Put their trust in him. Right there is a simple salvation message. He is telling the kings of the earth to be wise. I want to ask us all in here, did you know the only way to have peace with God is through Jesus Christ? The only way for us as individuals to have peace with God is through Jesus. Would the same admonition not be to us, we better be wise in the decisions that we make? Let me just ask you, have you put your trust in Jesus? Have you kissed the Son? Have you given him the respect that he deserves? Please look at that verse 12 again. Kiss the Son lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. God's promise is all of those that do not put Christ in his proper place are going to be separated from the way. They're going to be separated in a terrible place called the lake of fire for eternity. Have you paid homage to the Son? Have you put your faith and your trust in him? Let me add a little bit to that. Is he the king of your life? Or are you still the king of your life? You see, we celebrate Christmas, but... What we should be celebrating is the birth of the king. If we're truly celebrating the king, shouldn't we make him the king of our life now? Amen. Now I want to go back. I know I'm giving a lot to you this morning, but I want you all to think. Satan got in trouble because he wanted to be king. Mankind submitted to Satan and gave him the kingship for a time. So guess what? You have a choice today who your king is going to be, and there's only two choices. One is the kingdom of the world now. Who is king now? Satan is. There's a lot of people that choose him or the king of kings that is coming. Which is your choice? It's a simple choice. Look down back to our text in verse, verse 9. we got to hurry. We had better be wise too. Verse 9, the Bible says, Judah is a lion's whelp. I'm not going to spend much time on this. As you know, the Bible calls Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's called that and the root and the offspring of David in the book of Revelation he is the lion, the tribe of Judah, and we see that. Look on down to verse 10. This is the verse we really want to get to, and we're running out of time. Verse 10, back in Genesis 49, says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. The word scepter is the king's staff. Uh, if you remember the story of Ruth that we looked at not long ago, uh, about coming before the king unless the king held out his, his scepter. Uh, it's the scepter, it's the, the rod of the king. Also, the word lawgiver here is speaking of a king because the king is the only one that has authority to make laws. But now go on. It says, it shall not depart from Judah. In other words, the king will always come through Judah until Shiloh comes. Everybody say that in verse 10. The word Shiloh means two things. And I want you all to get this if you don't get anything else. The word Shiloh means two things. The first thing that it means and what the root of this word means is the one to whom all things belong. Now get that and chew it for just a minute. The one to whom all things belong. He owns everything. Is that an easier way to say it? The second thing that this word means, and you should recognize it, the word shalom comes from this same word. What is shalom in Hebrew? Y'all know Hebrew a little bit. What does shalom mean? Peace. It's their greeting, how they say hello and how they say goodbye, but it means peace to you. Peace. So not only does this mean the one whom everything belongs, it also means the one whom peace comes through. Now this is wonderful. I want you to think about those two things. Is Jesus the one to whom all things belong? In the book of Colossians it says, By Jesus were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things consist. He is the one to whom all things belong. Well, let's go to the part two. Is he the author of peace? What did Isaiah call him? The prince of peace. He is the author of peace. Folks, please get this. Peace in this earth will never come until Jesus is reigning. 
Peace in your heart with God can never come until Jesus is reigning. You know, we look around the world and we think, oh boy, they're rejecting God. You know, we can't change the world, but we can change ourselves. Is Jesus reigning in your life? You know, through my ministry, I've had a a lot of opportunities to talk to a lot of people. A lot of Christians who were going through some terrible, terrible troubles in their life. And sometimes it's as simple as saying, is Jesus the Lord of your life? Make him the Lord of your life and you'll have a lot more peace. You know, a lot of the troubles that we have in our life is because we start looking to ourselves for the leadership instead of him. We go out on our own. We try to be the king instead of him. You want peace in your life? Let him reign in your life. He is the author of peace. All peace comes toward him. What did the angels, the, the song says they sang it, what did the angels say to the shepherds, y'all remember? For under you is born this day in the city of David. Come on. Y'all hear this every Christmas. A Savior which is Christ the Lord. Okay, how'd they end it? Anybody? Come on, y'all. How about we sit here until y'all get it? No, I won't do that to you. <clears throat> what did they say? Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace and goodwill to all. It is only through Jesus that we can have peace. Shiloh, the one to whom all things belong and the author of peace. He is the one that's going to be king. The author of peace. Could there be a better king? Now look at the last phrase in verse 10. And this is where we'll quit. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. What a beautiful, beautiful phrase. The word gathering unto him literally means a group gathered together to give their lives in servitude. In other words, they're not gathered for no reason. They gather unto him to serve him. <clears throat> the Bible says right here, unto Jesus shall the gathering of all people be. When is this going to happen? You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14? He said, let not your heart be troubled. Y'all remember that. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, many mansions. You know all that. But he said, I will come again. And I will receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. The Apostle Paul gave us words in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Words that should comfort us. That say this. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, also, those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Listen. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these, with these words. It is coming very soon where we're going to be gathered unto Jesus. We call it the rapture. Shiloh has come once and he's coming again. He is going to bring peace to this earth. And he came the first time to bring peace in your life. Just some simple questions as we enter this Christmas season. Two things I want you to ask yourself this morning. Number one, first of all, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Do you know the Prince of Peace? The one who created you? The one that laid down his life for you? Do you know him in personal relationship? Have you put your trust in him? The Bible says, y'all know this, y'all say this with me, for God so loved the world, come on, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God provided Jesus so that we can have life, so that we would not perish. Have you trusted him? It doesn't matter what your husband and wife or has done, doesn't matter what your mom and dad has done, what have you done with Jesus? The book of Romans chapter 5, we won't turn there, but Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one way that this sinner can have peace with God, a righteous and holy God. You know, Brother uh, George was asking me about uh, something about God and his sinlessness. The Bible says that God cannot even look upon sin, that sin will never dwell with God. Well, then how can I, a sinner, and I hate to tell you all this, but your preacher has sinned today. Y'all close your mouth. It's true. I have. I bet y'all have too, probably. How could this old sinner 
have peace with an almighty God that cannot even look upon sin. The Bible says that peace comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. His blood covers my sins because he lived that sinless life. Do you have that peace with God the Father? It only comes through Jesus. He's the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Do you know him? That's the one question I want you to answer. And the second one, you may be saying, Brother Chris, I was saved a long time ago. I don't need a salvation message. Okay, then this. Is Christ ruling in your life? You want peace within your family, within your own heart? Let Christ rule. Give him the throne of your life. Folks, if he can bring peace to this old earth, which he's going to, we all believe he's going to, do you not think he can bring peace to your life and to your family? He can if you let him have control. Is he the king of your life? Two questions to answer. Is he your savior? And is he your king?